we have three presenters today. First, Greg Corrett, Director of Media and Accessible Design Laboratory, San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind. Then our next two presenters are both from APH, William Freeman, Tactile Technology Product Manager, and Karen Pope, Tactile Literacy Product Manager, part of the Educational Product Innovations Department at APH. Uh, so glad to have them with us. Let's talk about some challenges, some things that may be things that you struggle with. Creating maps from scratch, we know it definitely takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Not an easy thing to do. The use of custom maps made from scratch doesn't make it easier or build, from it, build familiarity um, with a lot of people. And it's difficult to standardize those at times. Students and older adults might need maps that are tailored to their tactile graphic skills. Not all of us are very good with tactile graphics. There's definitely some folks better with them than others. Embossers can be tough to use out of the box. And sometimes just getting high quality graphics into a student's hands beyond academic subjects is difficult. They're not always available and it's definitely not always easy to do. And let's talk about our learning objectives before we hand it over. We're gonna describe how to use the TMAP app to create tactile street maps. We'll describe how to use the PixBlaster to print TMAPs and other tactile graphics. And we'll identify three APH tools to improve student proficiency in using tactile maps. And then finally list three ways to augment and embellish tactile graphics. And with that, let's turn it over to Greg, who's going to present on TMAPs for us. Oh, okay. So let me share my screen. Give me a minute to click over here. And I think I will lead with this. You should all be seeing my agenda. Is that right? Yes, we can see your agenda. Great. Well, hello. I'm happy to be here. Um, a handful of slides and a live demo. That's how I'm gonna roll. Probably wouldn't even need the slides. I could just talk my way through it. Um, for my segment of today's presentation, I'm going to introduce you all to TMAP. You know, for those 65% uh, of you who have not attended to a TMAP presentation before. Um, so that with your free user account, you can generate and emboss your own Braille and tactile street maps. So how cool is that? Along the way, I will be talking about what TMAP is. The web app, the tactile maps, how to use the TMAP web app. And for this, I will um, do a live demo. And how to get it, how to get your free user account. And if I'm efficient and don't digress too much, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end of my segment. Um, so you can throw those up in the chat at some point or hang on to them. And when I come up for air, we can just barrage me with questions. Um, and hopefully I'll get some questions from those 35% who may have seen a version of this presentation before. Um, that would be nice. Um, so what is TMAP? For those of you who don't know, TMAP, T-M-A-P, writ all caps, is an acronym for Tactile Maps Automated Production. And before I get into the, the nitty gritty with that, a bit of history to give credit where credit is due. Dr. Josh Mealy invented TMAP while a researcher at Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute in San Francisco. They partnered with the Lighthouse for the Blind for production and distribution of tactile maps. And we've also worked together on a number of improvements to the web app itself. All right, so what is this TMAP thing? TMAP is a web-based app that creates tactile street maps. Web-based meaning it runs in a web browser. 
So you simply log in to a website, in this case, tmap.lighthouse-sf.org. And if you didn't catch that, don't worry, we'll plug all this stuff into the chat before we're done today. It produces PDFs that are downloaded and embossed, like on a Pix Blaster or printed on swell paper. So what kind of maps are we talking about? TMAP produces street maps for wayfinding and orientation. Um, these are at the scale of a neighborhood, anywhere from a few blocks to a few miles. TMAP can include pedestrian paths and railways, but it does not encompass any and everything under the sun. Uh, this is by design because features of geography, topography, various data overlays can easily overwhelm a tactile map with clutter, rendering it unreadable. So T maps produce street maps. And um, as evidenced by the number of poll takers, it's really been attractive to orientation and mobility specialists, um, especially during you know this last year during COVID, where people had to adapt to long-term distance learning, and it became evident that oh, here's a new tool, where, and into the foreseeable future, I see no reason why teachers wouldn't keep doing this. Um, teachers can generate maps download them, print them out, email or send, you know, snail mail maps to their students. And then the two can just jump on a call, whether Zoom or FaceTime or what have you, and actually do all sorts of lessons related to orientation and mobility. I would like to draw your attention, make a note about that earlier Access Academy webinar last July. It was called TMAPS Building Environmental Literacy. Um, the preamble, my section is more or less similar, but I was joined by three orientation and mobility specialists on that presentation, and they have quite a bit to share that is relevant. So if your profession is orientation and mobility and you'd like to glean a lot more insight into how to use TMAP with your students, the ins and outs of it, the pitfalls, things you can avoid, um, success stories, case, case stories, or I should say case histories, by all means, check that out. I will not be diving in headlong into the O&M perspective today, um, not least because I'm not qualified to do so. I am not an orientation and mobility specialist, though I do get to hang out with O&Mers a lot, which is, I've learned quite a bit by doing it. But as you know, that's a, that is a dedicated profession. Um, so where was I? Because I did start to digress. So it creates tactile street maps. Um, it is automated. So you determine the address, the scale, the paper size and page orientation, whether landscape or portrait. You select which features to include but you do not have to design this map from scratch. Uh, best practices for good tactile design have been built into the software. So maintaining a standardized layout, spacing between tactile elements, um, line and dot heights, braille labeling, it's all taken care of, it's all automated. Uh, I cannot overstate the immense savings in time, energy, bother, and even cost that this automation affords. Any of you who have made your own maps from scratch know what I'm talking about. Um, the standardized layout and representation is also a real asset because once you or your students have familiarized yourself with one TMAP tactile map, they're apt to readily comprehend any others because they're all laid out the same. They're all an identical style. And as I mentioned, the maps you generate are downloaded as PDF and SVG files for local embossing or printing. 
or delivered via email to anyone who can produce tactile graphics. So let's talk a little bit about the web app and then we will actually check it out. Um, the web app being the user interface for creating tactile maps. The main web pages of TMAP are search address, create map, file preview, and download. <clears throat> it's fairly simple. Then at this point, let me switch over to the actual app. You should all be looking at the landing page for TMAP. tmap.lighthouse-sf.org. Um, notice I have to log in. This is the login screen, which you can also do once you've requested your TMAP account. To request an account, simply send us a polite note at tmap at lighthouse-sf.org. That's T-M-A-P at lighthouse-sf, as in San Francisco, dot org. Um, we need your name and email address at the least. Knowing your affiliation is nice. If you care to tell us about, you know, your credentials, who you, where you work, etc. cetera. Um, if it's not already in the chat, I'll be sure to put all these links in the chat when I'm done with my bid. <clears throat> Anyway, let me log in really quickly. Ta-da, this is the TMAP landing page. This is very screen reader friendly. You can tab through it. Everything is labeled. It's very simple. Its main function is a search box. And when you first arrive on the page, your cursor is in the search box. The placeholder reads, where are you traveling? And um, note these links at the bottom of the page. More info, that links to lighthouse-sf.org slash TMAP. That's home base for all things TMAP. Um, guide, that's pretty much how to step-by-step -step instructions. So any of the things that we're discussing today or that William will be talking about, you will find written information. Um, FAQ, that's self-explanatory, mostly called from chats, actually. Order, this is, whoops, I'm hitting the wrong button. Order, if you can't emboss your own TMAPs, you can purchase maps from adaptations.org. That is the Lighthouse's web store. And that's why that is there. So let, let's get back to our map making. Um, you enter an address. That's really the starting point. Oh, good heavens. I should have turned off my email. That is annoying. Um, enter an address, intersection, or place name and click the search button or hit enter. I'll mention that TMAP uses Google Maps search. So if your spelling isn't perfect or you don't know the complete address, you don't know the zip code or what have you, it's okay. Google usually figures it out. If Google can't figure it out, it will actually um, offer you a number of options of what it thinks you're looking for and then you can pick that. Very occasionally you will get an, oops, we cannot process that request. That could be a deeper problem. Um, you'll wanna verify that address. Um, sometimes it's an addressing convention thing. Um, I usually encounter that when I'm trying to make maps outside of the United States or rather outside of North America. TMAP does pretty well with maps in the United States, Canada, even Mexico, um, Western Europe, particularly the Commonwealth countries. It's pretty solid, um, but it, I've gotten uneven results in other places in the world. 
Um, you know what? One second here. I'm gonna. I need to kill my email because it's. I don't know if it's distracting to you, but it's certainly distracting to me. So let's get back to our map making. Remember our trivia question about bendiest street. Um, let's check out rather than checking out um, Lombard. I'm going to put in Vermont Street and oops, it would help if I spell it correctly, even though I said I don't need to. It actually helps if I do. Um, and 20th Street. Clicking on search. Oh, well, maybe this is a great example of I thought it would figure it out. It gave me a lot of search results that I don't want. So tell you what, I'm going to go back. I'm going to try again. Well, this is awkward. OK, one more time. Vermont Street. Probably should have tested it this morning. That would have been great. Vermont Street and 20th San Francisco. Yay, it worked. OK. Um, yeah, so clicking search advances one to the create map page. And for those of you who can't see the screen, the preview shows a very bendy street. So on this create map page, the main elements of this page are search, bar and button, create map, which is a button, paper size, map scale, distance units, these are all drop down menus, um, features to include on your map, such as streets, um, paths, service roads, railways. These are all buttons. Um, and there's this map box viewer. So a word for screen reader users, um, you can tab to this map box and the arrow keys will move the image around. Um, but it behaves differently across different browsers. And ultimately, screen reader users have to download and emboss the map to know exactly what they are getting. But notice too, on this page, that the title of our page um, and of the map itself is our search term, Vermont Street and 20th, but showing as a full proper address. So it's been filled in, San Francisco, uh, city, state, zip code. And this corresponds to a locator dot that will appear on the tactile map as a raised symbol. So this really helps orient the map reader, the address they can readily find on the map. Um, a few words about the features to include on these maps. Streets, paths, service roads, railways. So we've bundled together collections of different types of streets. So be it, you know, road streets, highways, freeways, basically cars go here. Paths, same thing. Um, primarily people go here, pedestrians go here, but it could be bridle paths, um, hiking trails, bike paths, things of that nature. Service roads is also a catch-all, could be alleyways, could be the sorts of service roads you find on college campuses, um, could even be, you know, the driveways and things around housing complexes. Um, basically cars and pedestrians go here. And railways too, that's a catch all. We've bundled together light rail, elevated train. Essentially, if it's above ground, it will appear on your map. Um, sidewalks, pedestrian paths, a word about that. Sidewalks as a rule, have been turned off in TMAP. And the reason is because every time you would generate a street map, it would introduce a great deal of clutter because every single street line 
would be doubled with a dotted line showing a pedestrian path. And it makes for a very cluttered tactual map. And so we've turned them off under the assumption that most streets, not all, but most streets have sidewalks associated with them. Obviously, this is not always true. It's certainly not true of high of freeways, probably not even of highways. Um, and we are all familiar with those usually suburban subdivisions and the like, which were designed for automobiles, which you can walk on the road, but there's actually no proper shoulder. It would be nice to have sidewalks represented there and probably in a future build, we'll be able to address that as an option that people can toggle on or off. So in the meantime, you can't necessarily make a safe assumption about whether a sidewalk will be present. Um, just that caveat, just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, and I mentioned that TMAP uses Google to search for and verify addresses, but TMAP uses OpenStreetMap data to actually build the maps. That is an open source, kind of like a Wikipedia. So this means that the data you want sometimes is not available. So an example would be if you select paths and service roads for a given map, because you know they're there, and yet they don't appear on your map. And that really could just be, for whatever reason, the data at OpenStreetMap is not complete. And the reason we use OpenStreetMap is because it's free. Um, so it makes TMAP affordable for us. Um, paper size, map scale, distance units. Paper sizes, North American standards, including our Braille paper, 11 and a half by 11 inches, which is our default. Um, you can also choose um, you know, letter size, tabloid, um, portrait or landscape orientations. Um, you can play around with that depending on, you know, how much you want to squeeze onto your map. Map scale or zoom level, some people think of it as. Um, there are six levels from 1 to 1500 through 1 to 50,000. So on our 11 inch square braille paper, these correspond to roughly a city block, about 370 feet, um, up to two mile wide maps, meaning what you can fit on the screen. Um, the greater the ratio, uh, the greater amount of information on the map. And just by a quick example, for those who can see, if I click up to one to 50,000, one can see about a two mile square of San Francisco, a lot of streets, a lot of lines. Um, tactually, that would probably be like trying to read a plate of spaghetti. Um, it's too much information. These higher ratios work better for rural or suburban environments that are less dense. Um, as you learn a new area, it can be helpful to generate multiple scales of the same address. I've just clicked on one to 2,500, which, you know, it's more like showing about two blocks. Um, and because I can actually move the focus, I can kind of like frame the portion of the map that I would ideally like to see. So I can get the wiggly bit here of Vermont Street an area of pedestrian paths and the like. But anyway, that scaffolding of information, you know, starting from simplest to complex is a nice way to introduce maps to students. So once they get the basic layout, then you can introduce maybe a heightened scale that has more information on it, but now they can place it in context. Um, yeah, until you find out what works best for you and the student. And distance units, uh, feet, or meters, take your pick. This will appear as a scale line on the tactile map itself. And of course, there is a create map button, which my screen is hidden behind my little pop up here. Um, 
So yeah, if I tab on over to create map button, is it gonna work? Should work. Well, let me see. First, let me pick some uh, features. Streets, paths. I will go with my default paper sizes. And my focus seems to have gone off somewhere. There we go. Oh, sorry, I just tabbed right over it. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to cheat. Sorry about that, folks. By clicking on Create Map, once we've made all of our selections, uh, features, page size, scale, etc., this advances us to the download page. In the main elements, again, we have our search bar and button, download and email buttons, the address, title, and a visual file preview. So this differs from the earlier Mapbox viewer. This preview shows the image of the actual map file to be embossed. Um, so this map that we're looking at features streets and pedestrian paths. In the upper left appears the address as the title. This corresponds to the raised locator dot on the map, um, which in this instance is at the intersection of Vermont and 20th. At the upper right, the scale is shown. On this map, what appears to be approximately one inch in length equals 100 feet. I had selected one to 2,500 as my ratio. Also in the upper right is a compass arrow pointing north. Around the perimeter, notice that anywhere a street meets the margins are labels of street names. And these are abbreviated to save space. The full street names appear on an, an accompanying key, which we'll also check out. So that's important to know. Each T map consists of a map plus a key. And then we have our download or email buttons. So this results in a zip file containing PDF and SVG files of a tactile map with braille labels, a visual map with large print labels, a tactile key, and a visual key. Um, at the Lighthouse, we, we prefer working from the PDF and that's what William will be demonstrating today with the Pix Blaster. If using a swell machine, you'd opt to print either tactile or visual files, I guess, depending on whether you or your student are a braille reader or not. For Pix Blaster production, you'll emboss the tactile map and key. Um, a brief aside that maps ordered through adaptations.org are both visual and tactile. They contain both ink print, large print ink, and braille. So I can email these files to William, who will be doing a demonstration uh, later. Um, actually, that's not his address. There you go or I can download these for my own uh, local use. So I think we'll take a quick look. I'm gonna show you what this tactile map is like. I'm gonna open up the PDF. Um, if we were in person, I would of course have physical samples to hand out and we could all put our hands on these things. Um, yes, page one, page one of the PDF is the tactile and braille view. Solid lines represent streets. Dotted lines are pedestrian paths. We have our raised um, symbol denoting the address. The next page in the PDF is the visual version. Not much different, but the braille has been substituted with large print. And then there's our braille key and our large print key. Um, a word about the key, because I didn't really mention it. Again, um, symbols and line types used, the first symbol being associated with the address. Um, 
a sample of the line related to streets, the dotted line for paths, and then a list of all the abbreviations of all of these street names. Um, 20 corresponds to the full name, 20th Street, JMS, James Lick Freeway, KNS, Kansas Street, et cetera. Um, what else should I say about that? Well, I should mention that because of the space constraints, street labels are limited to five Braille characters. Um, these abbreviations appear in the key, followed by the full street name. As I've just demonstrated, the Braille on the map and key are uncontracted, grade one. And labels, as they appear on the map, are centered on the streets where they meet the margin. Um, Notice here, by the way, that street orientation is also included. This can be really helpful um, for O&M. So whether the street runs east to west, north to south, in this instance, James Lick Freeway runs northwest to southeast. Um, sometimes two streets may intersect at the margin and knowing the street orientation can help if there's any ambiguity uh, about which streets are which. Um, I'll also mention that if streets do not meet the edge of the map, they will not get a name, they won't get a label. And that too is by design. Um, it can sometimes be a little frustrating, but overall perhaps less frustrating than dropping braille labels into the middle of the tactile map because Braille itself can introduce clutter and can obfuscate things. So by design, we label things at the end. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of TMAP in a nutshell. Like that's, that's the quick tour. And I think what I should do is I've got one more slide here I can show as I tell you a bit about how to get it. So um, you can print your own. You can acquire a free user account to create, download, and emboss team apps yourself to request a user account. Email tmap at lighthouse-sf.org. And again, if it's not already in the chat, I'll be sure to throw that up there. Um, this is a good option if you have access to or know someone who has access to a graphics embosser or swell machine. Not everyone does have production tools. So for that reason, adaptations.org is in this list. TMAP tactile maps can be purchased retail through adaptations for $25 a packet. So in the packet, you receive two maps of the same address at different scales, a zoomed out overview, and a zoomed in detail, right? Showing streets, paths, et cetera, uh, whatever information is available for that address. Of course, the map key and an introductory page, kind of a summation um, of things that I've talked about that help map readers orient themselves to a tactile map particularly useful if they um, or you are new to reading tactile maps. Um, by default, all materials are printed on our 11 and a half by 11 inch sheets of embossed paper. They are including ink and large print labels in addition to Braille. Um, we do customizations. So if there are things like buildings or additional points of interest, maybe it's not just the address you're curious about, um, but maybe a second address or two or three different things on the map you'd like included, or you wanna opt for some of those different paper sizes, um, you can put that request into adaptations and we kind of handle those on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the level of customization needed. Um, a good example are campus maps. 
So you can imagine a college campus has a lot of, you know, not just service path or service roads, but um, wide open areas, plazas and buildings. Buildings themselves um, can be a good um, identifying characteristic to include in a map. Karen is gonna be talking about some of these things. There are ways to customize maps yourself in you know, using collage methods without doing customizations, um, but sometimes it can be practical. Um, bulk orders, when we do these customizations, um, so if we're talking about making maps for schools or agencies that serve the blind or conferences and the like, um, you know, you, you can get a bulk discount. We're obviously not going to be selling, you know, if you need 100 maps, you don't have to pay $25 a pop to get those because it's just making many copies of one thing rather than 100 different things. Um, Betsy or anybody, how are we doing on time? And are there questions piling up in the chat that I can um, consider? Because I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, Greg, we've got one question in the chat. So if you're at a good uh, stopping point, we can launch the poll and address um, the question that's come in and any uh, follow up questions that brings up. Yeah, great. So Paul will, um, once we get switched back over, we'll have you launch these poll questions. All right, we have two questions for you. Both of these are yes or no questions. So we, we want to know, do you have a way to print T-maps, yes or no? And we also want to know, will you be printing any T-maps for yourself or family or friends or students in, within the next month? And that is also a yes or no question. So do you have a way to print T-maps and will you be printing any in the next month, yes or no? And uh, as you answer that question, again, please leave your questions for Greg in the chat. We'll get to as many of those as we can. All right, so we're gonna go back a little bit um, to address the first question that came in. Is there a way to troubleshoot when the tactile graphics will print but Braille will not using a View Plus embosser in Mac? Do you have any strategies for blind individuals creating maps? Ooh, um, I'm guessing that this question comes from real life experience that you may have been trying to emboss a T-map tactile map and the Braille didn't come out. I think I will invite you to send your question if you need a deep dive on this to write us T-map at Lighthouse. Um, I say that because one, I can't think off the top of my head why your Braille wouldn't appear, but you also mentioned you're working on a Mac and I for one am not familiar running T-maps on a Mac. Um, although people on our team do. But as for the most part, people are printing just from the PDF, I cannot think why that would happen. Um, so I'm sorry, that's not a very satisfactory answer, but I think we're gonna have to take that one offline. Yeah, and, uh, I just wanna bring up that, the second part of the question. Yeah. Do you have any strategies for blind individuals creating maps? So is the TMAP website, is it fully accessible? And I know you were using kind of a click and drag feature to scale the map in and out. Are there other ways to do that? So um, TMAP, the website is largely screen reader friendly. Um, I'm a bit of a uh, click and point moron. So at one point I failed in my tabbing. And so I actually clicked over on the mouse. Um, but I actually did test it before speaking today. And yes, you can tab into the Mapbox viewer and you can interact with the, um, your, your arrows will move the image and you can also interact with the zoom in and zoom out but it really does, it's very browser dependent. It really does, depending on which browser you're using, your, your mileage may vary. Um, and the Mapbox viewer itself, again, is at least to get feedback on it. You know, you'll get some feedback labels about the controls and the like, but to really know what is being represented, you really do just have to download the files and emboss them. So it's a little bit of trial and error. I is, think. There, is there a uh, browser that you'd recommend? Um, Chrome. 
Chrome seem, has been fairly consistent. Um, obviously, if you're using a Mac, Safari would, would be a thing. And actually, maybe um, now that you ask, and I don't really have a firm answer, I may actually dive into our FAQ to just see if this um, has been documented. And I can certainly do a, a backline inquiry to one of my, my colleagues. And I can put that in the chat if I come up with something more uh, definite. Great. Uh, the second question that came up, more of a statement, but small towns often have random si sidewalks or not. And O&M lessons generally really need that info. So just, I guess, uh, a bit of uh, support for being able to emboss sidewalks on maps, even though um, you know, you have the road and, and adding the sidewalk might be too much information that that might be important for cer certain circumstances. And another yeah. point, oh, sorry. Well, I just wanted to address that. That actually brings up two things. And with the mention of small town, mm -hmm. um, this ties back to open street map. Um, we have found that um, urban areas tend to be very well represented in open street map they're very thoroughly mapped like a lot of information is in there you can get very accurate representations but it can get excuse me uneven in other uh, in smaller towns and the like so even for example if sidewalks or pedestrian paths are present um, it doesn't necessarily mean that open street map is going to ha have that information or it may be incomplete and I speak from recent experience where I, I just did some maps for a woman who was living, um, I can't remember exactly where, but it was obvious from the map box viewer and from Google, I could tell there were pedestrian paths and things of that nature. And yet when I generated my T-map, there were gaps where these things should have been filled in. So just something else to keep in mind. And, um, and again, I think you'll see from Karen, you know, Keep in mind that TMAP may not be the be all end all like right out of the box, but it's certainly a huge time saver and it can give you the basic template um, that you can then build on. So if you, you know, use it to generate a map of that small town and it's really important to illustrate where these sidewalks are, it's easy for, to add um, such features yourself. Uh, I believe Karen is going to be talking about collage methods. If you were doing swell paper production, you could easily print out that map and use, use white out to erase lines. You could draw lines in, thicken lines, and then send it through the swell machine and you know have your own you know ad hoc customized map. And another comment came in, I'm a VI college student and have been interested in T-maps for a while, including possibilities of campus maps, where it's mostly walkways without roads. Mm -hmm. So another strong statement. Yeah, for that, I mean, I found pedestrian paths on campuses tend to be very well represented. Oh, great. And a lot of times you can infer from the pattern of these paths when it's crossing quads and the like. Mm. Um, it, it is interesting when you think of plazas and the like, you know, when you think of campuses and city civic centers um, where it's really wide open space, you know, there's all kinds of paths of travel that you could take to get from any one place to any other. But you'll actually find that, that a specific path of travel has oftentimes been um, delineated in OpenStreetMap and Google for that matter too. So I, I certainly recommend that people play around with these things um, and gain some familiarity. That's really the best way to learn about TMAP is to start plugging addresses in and playing around with the different settings to um, check out your results. Great, and one final question. There's been a lot of chat about using PDF unembed fonts 
And I know that William's going to be talking about that in his presentation. So I'll ask you one final question, Greg. How well does the view plus in Braille embossed maps on the narrow paper? Is that one of the options that you were speaking of, the, the types of paper that you can use to print T maps? By narrow paper, I will assume we're talking letter size paper, eight and a half by 11. Um, it really works fine. I mean, the advantage of the larger paper sizes is that you have more real estate um, to, to map on and tactile graphics and braille, they, they benefit from a lot of space. Um, but there's no reason why you can't emboss on letter size. Um, and really that's, that's a good default um, because a lot of people, especially for small production, you know, if you just have a home office printer, it probably can't accommodate larger or odd paper sizes anyway. Mm -hmm. so just generating your maps on letter size is really the easiest way to, to ensure that it can get embossed or printed out. We, I'll just mention a quick plug. It's a side, I, I didn't prepare a slide for this, but light, the Lighthouse recently started um, a new project called Touching the News, um, whereby every couple of weeks, we're just pushing out free tactile graphics of items that are trending things that, you know, whether it's memes or emojis or news items or, you know, sciencey stuff works well. Um, all of those tactile graphics that we're making are formatted for letter size paper, just for that very reason, because it's more common. It's more versatile. And we're pushing those out as graphics that can be embossed on um, Pix Blasters or Swell, depending. That's a great resource. Thanks for plugging that. Touching the news. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't have a link for that. But if you I were, I can find to, one. Yeah, if you were to Google it or go to the Lighthouse website, you could find a more about that thing. All right, I'll be on the hunt for that as we move on to the, our next presenter, William Freeman. All right. Thanks. Um, appreciate that. That was really great and very informative. Uh, let me just share my screen. And I'm going to start. So what I'm going to do is I've got a first I've got a PowerPoint uh, where I'm just going to talk about the Pix Blaster and kind of go over that. That doesn't take any time at all, just a couple minutes. And then we're going to go into using PDF unembed font. So we'll actually go download PDF unembed font. I'll tell you where to put it so that it's easy to use and work with and easy to find. We'll go over using it with a mouse and with a keyboard and kind of what PDF on embed font does and why it needs to be done and how it can be useful for other graphics, uh, not just for um, not just for TMAPs. All right, so uh, what is PixBlaster? PixBlaster is an embosser available from APH uh, through a uh, partnership with uh, ViewPlus. And it is based on a Columbia 2. So it's based on the View Plus Columbia 2. And I actually have a picture of it up on the screen right now, and I'll just briefly describe it. And so it is gray, it's mostly gray. And then along the front is the logo, and then the word Pix Blaster. And then there are the four buttons that you can use to interact with the embosser. So there's menu, there's up, there's down, and there's cancel. If you bought an embosser from APH and you're not sure uh, which embosser you bought, you know? So um, did you get a Pix Blaster? Did you get a Page Blaster? The way to tell is just by the number of buttons. So, you know, if, you, if you're not sure uh, if it has four buttons, that's a Pix Blaster. If it has a lot more than four buttons, that's a Page Blaster. So that's just kind of the easiest easiest way to tell between the two of them. So regardless of which embosser you get from APH, what can you expect? So you're gonna get high quality braille. They both use tractor fed paper. They both have interpoint capabilities. Uh, they both come with APH documentation. And then they also come with videos for each embosser. Uh, the videos are great. So let's say you haven't gotten one of our embossers and you're thinking about getting one. I would suggest watch the videos. So watch the videos. They're going to cover 
they're, they're basically going to cover the parts that we felt were going to be the most complicated for people. So watch the videos, get an idea of how the embossers work, where the pain points are, how complicated they might be to work with. I don't think either of them are very complicated, uh, but they, you know, we did make videos to help folks with the parts that may be more difficult. So check them out and that might help inform your decision. Uh, the other thing you're going to get is a APH customer support. So the Pix Blasters through View Plus, the Page Blasters through Humanware, well, you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, if you bought an embosser from APH and you have any issues, you can call APH and we'll be the ones who help you uh, sort, any, sort any issues out that you might have. Uh, they both cost the same price. They're both $3,995 and they're both available on Quota. So I'll just run through the Pix Blaster features real quick. So it's going to come with everything you need in one box. Uh, it comes with a speaker and the Pixie. What is the Pixie, you might be asking? I'll cover that in just a moment. And then kind of the main things are going to be, it's got high quality tactile graphics. So you get multi-height tactile graphics. Uh, it uses a new dot technology called Power Dot Braille. So you're going to get a, a nice, smooth, round dot that is you know easy to feel. You can adjust the dot height as well. Um, and then the, the cool thing we're going to be covering today is the easy to use software interface and the fact it works great with software you're already familiar with. So when you're working with TMAPs, you're just going to open that TMAP in Adobe. Uh, and then you're going to go to file, you're going to go to print, and then you're going to select your Pix Blaster embosser, and then it's going to emboss it. It comes with the Tiger software suite. Uh, which you can use to edit. Um, you can use it to, you can actually use it to emboss TMAPs. We're not going to cover that method today, but one of the methods for embossing TMAPs is to open them in Word and then emboss them from Word. Uh, we're not going to have time to get into that today. We're going to focus on the PDF method, uh, but it also comes with Tiger Designer, which you can use to edit and create your own tactile graphics. Uh, real quick, the Pixie. Is a, it's a little box. It's a Raspberry Pi with special software on it, and it adds wireless capabilities to the Pix Blaster. So you can now use Wi-Fi with your Pix Blaster. Now, the coolest thing that it does is it gives you access to the Pixie interface. So the Pixie interface is a, is a neat way to interact with your embosser. So once you've set up your embosser, um, and you've, you've connected it to your Wi-Fi, which is real easy to use, really, really easy to do thanks to the Pixie. I can then, so you've got your embosser set up, you've got it connected to Wi-Fi. I come over, I need to emboss something fast. I've got a team app, uh, I, need, I need to emboss it yesterday. And so what I'm gonna do is I've got it on my phone. I can actually get on your Wi-Fi, go to http colon slash slash Pixie, you know, real easy to remember, just HTTP colon slash slash Pixie. And then I can connect to your Pixie interface. And then I can, I can emboss whatever I have to your embosser through the, the Pixie interface. It's really easy to use. Uh, it supports a lot of file types and it makes it, it's an easy way to interact with the embosser um, without actually setting up, without going to the trouble of setting up the embosser again. Because you don't want to, you know, you set it up with your computer. You don't want to then have to set it up with your phone and set it up with your laptop and set it up with your tablet. Uh, and the, you know, the, the millions of devices we're all fortunate enough to, to have and be aware of. So that's the cool thing about the Pixie interface. It doesn't support PDFs. So I may have been, I didn't mean to suggest that. I was just getting excited. Uh, so it does support BRF, BRL, and PRN but you could make a PRN of your, of your TMAP if you wanted to. All right, graphic embossing. So like I said, uh, you can emboss PDFs from Adobe. You can emboss graphics like, say you've got a, you could make a JPEG. So just take a screenshot of your TMAP and then you could take that over to uh, Tiger Designer to finish it up and make a PRN. So you could add Braille to it. You could, you could edit it whatever it is you needed to do, um, add fill patterns, use the shape tools, adjust the density. There'd be a bit of work involved. It's no longer quite as automatic at that point, but it is something you could do if you wanted to. So that's just a quick introduction of uh, Pix Blaster.
And so now what we're going to do is we're going to jump into getting the PDF unembed font and using it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go to viewplus.com. And let me cover this real quick. So why do you need PDF unembed font? So unembed font, it does exactly what it says on the tin. It takes the Braille font and it basically, it basically takes it out and puts it back. And so the key is it's taking out the font and then making it clear that it is a font. If you don't do it, what ends up happening is the embosser can think that the words are an image. And so by taking them out and putting them back in, it takes them out as an image and puts them back as words. And so this way the embosser knows that it's dealing with text and it knows to treat it as text. So we will go to, we're at viewplus.com. We go to support and then we go to downloads. So we go to downloads and then we just need to scroll down and we will eventually find PDF unembed font. You could also just do control F PDF unembed font. And then that would get you right there, unembed fonts. Uh, it is not limited to just one font. And so as soon as you interact with the link, it will start downloading it. And what I'm gonna suggest is that you want to, you can go ahead and it's gonna download a zip. And I'm gonna suggest that you put it in a specific location. So go to your main drive. So it's gonna be C for most folks, and then go to your user profile. So you go C users, and then just find your username. So I've got several different users, uh, but at my main user, the one I'm using now is wfreeman.aph. So I'm just gonna go there. I'm gonna save it there. I've actually already saved it, but I'll go ahead and replace it. And so go ahead and save it. And you're wanting to put it in this user folder because it's gonna make the next steps that we do much easier because it, it'll be much easier to find. So once you download the zip, you wanna un, unzip it. So you'll go ahead and open it. You'll go to your compressed folder tools. You'll go to extract all. And then you're gonna wanna, this is another little thing. Go ahead and shorten where you're unzipping it to. So you just wanna unzip it to basically where you are. So C colon slash users slash W Freeman dot APH, so your username. So you basically just wanna delete because otherwise it's gonna put it in a second folder. So go ahead and just delete that first folder where it says PDF on embed font. Just click extract. I've already extracted it, but I'll go ahead and replace it. It's a quick, quick thing to do. And now, We've, we've unzipped it, it's in our user folder, and it's right there. I've actually already downloaded a TMAP and put it in this same folder. I'll just show you. So I've got uh, Lombard Street here, because I'm a tourist, so I, I picked the tourist uh, place. And so that's I've got Lombard Street ready to go. And I've just kept, you know, when you download it, it's a zip. Just, you know, when you download your map, it's going to be a zip. So I've already extracted it, but I've kept the, the, the default name that it comes with. So it's still got the tmap.pdf name. And so if you're a mouse user, just put your tmap in the PDF unembed fonts folder, easy enough, and then just pick up the, the PDF and then just drop it on this unembed fonts.bat file. So you just drop it on the unembed fonts.map file and you're gonna get this warning. And it's a scary warning. Windows protected your PC. Uh, Microsoft Defender smart screen prevented an unrecognized app from starting. Running this app might put your PC at risk. Uh, more info, and it's because it's not signed. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a batch file is what they're called and they're typically not signed. And ordinarily, if you get this warning, just a little, a little PC security tip, uh, ordinarily, I would say, go ahead and don't run it. Just say, don't run. 
but you can trust this, this file. It's going to be fine. Uh, we recommended it. it'll be fine. So go ahead and say run anyway, in this case. And then that will run. It's going to put up this little screen of the command line. And it, it says press any key to continue. So just go ahead and press any key. And it will dismiss the little pop up there. And now you'll have a new file in your folder. And what it'll be is it'll be the same file name as your PDF, now followed by underscore VP. So I've got tmap.pdf and I've got tmap underscore vp.pdf. If I open them, so I've already got tmap open. I'm going to go ahead and open the underscore vp. They look exactly the same. So I've got tmap, I've got tmap underscore vp. There's no visual difference. The only thing it did was it's, it basically pulled out the fonts and made it very clear to the embosser that they are fonts. And so these will emboss, you know, you just go file, print, and then you find your Pixblaster and you don't wanna print all four pages. So you go pages to print, select pages, and then you can just do one comma three. And then that's going to print just the two braille pages to your uh, Pixblaster. So that's how you do it with a mouse. Um, are there questions coming in so far? I see there's a lot of things coming in in the chat, but I wasn't sure if they were things for me or. No, there are no questions so far for you, other than the questions that you've been addressing about the PDF on embed fonts. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks. All right, so the other thing we want to cover, I'm going to go ahead and delete. Um, I'm going to go ahead and delete my uh, underscore VP, and I'm going to do it again. But this time, I'm going to do it uh, using the command line. So the command line, you know, it's a keyboard method of, of, of interacting with your computer. And this is the accessible way to, to use PDF on embed font. Um, it's also, you know, Using the command line is always a fun thing to do because it, you feel like a hacker. You feel like you're doing something something cool. Um, so to get to the PDF on embed font, just if you're on Windows 10, all you have to do is press the Windows key, just press the Windows key, and then type CMD. And then that's going to open up the command prompt. So it opens up the command prompt. And it's going to open it on your user folder. So that's why I asked you to put it in your user folder, because that's going to make it so much easier uh, to interact with. So you've got it. Uh, you've got your focus already on your user folder. You've got your uh, PDF in the same folder. You've got unembed font ready to go. So all you have to do is first direct the focus of the command line to, to the uh, PDF unembed fonts folder. And you're going to do that using CD. So that stands for change directory. And you're going to go CD PDF unembed fonts. And then that's going to put you in the PDF unembed fonts folder. So now that you're in that folder, you need to run the script uh, on your PDF. So we're going to go, so you just type PDF unembed fonts space and then period slash. And then you're going to put in the file name of your PDF. So I've kept the default file name. So it's just tmap.pdf. That's it. And then I'm going to press enter. So then that's going to run the unembed font tool. Now, I didn't get the big scary warning this time, but that's because I got it last time and I already said OK. So if, you, if this is the first time running it, you'll still get that big scary warning again. Uh, but that's really all there is to it. And by by putting everything in your user directory, it'll make it a little easier to navigate. If you if you need uh, if you want to put it somewhere else, you'll need to use that change directory uh, command. So cd to move to different locations uh, until you find it. But it, if it, using the command line is really not that hard. And if you have trouble, you can just use your favorite search engine 
uh, to find out the different commands and the things like that. But if you're a keyboard user, you probably are already fairly familiar uh, with, using, um, with using the command line. So were there any questions about any of that? Oh, yes. Is there a cheat sheet explaining how to do this? There is a cheat sheet and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it in the chat right now. And it is from our friends at the Lighthouse. And it explains how to get the PDF unembed font, how to use it with a mouse and how to use it via command line. So yes, uh, thank you for asking about that because that is something I wanted to make sure uh, folks were aware of. And William, I'm so sorry. I was on mute uh, trying to answer your question. There were a few questions that came in. I just want to be aware of the time as we don't want to run over into Karen's presentation. It is 4.11. Mm -hmm. But two questions came in. Is there capability to print text on this embosser? Um, so to print, uh, no. So that would be um, interlining. And this is not an interline embosser. Um, if you need an interline embosser, View Plus, they make some, and then they also make an adapter. That adapter does not work with the Pix Blaster, but they do. They do. Have, there are several options available from View Plus and other companies if interlining is something you you want to be able to do. Great. And the second question was, what program do you use to emboss these graphics on them in my ABS? I don't know if this is bla if this blaster comes with its own software or do you have something like Duxbury Translator to emboss this with the Pix Blaster embosser? Also, I was yeah. wondering how durable you're saying the swell paper is. Does it last at least a whole school year? Okay, uh, the swell paper will be a good question for Greg or Karen. They probably have more um, experience with that than I do. Um, as far as the software, so to to emboss a T map you can just use Adobe. I would recommend using Adobe. You can open PDFs in your browser and you can emboss from your browser, but you're gonna get mixed results. It's that same situation Greg was talking about where some embossers are better or some browsers are better than others. Uh, by just recommending Adobe, I know you're gonna get, I know what kind of experience you're gonna get. And so I really would recommend just download Adobe. It's free, it, you know, Regardless of what you think about Adobe as a company, it's still probably the best way to view and read and interact with PDFs. So that would be my recommendation. And if you have a Pix Blaster, you know, you can use it with Braille 2000, Duxbury, or Braille Blaster as far as Braille transcription programs. And then I, I see what browser works best came in. Uh, again, I think Greg was recommending Chrome. So I yeah. think. Yeah, he said Chrome, Firefox, or Safari in the okay, chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So those are those are the ones that we want to. Oh, and thank you, Greg, for popping those back in. Yeah. Thanks. All right, we had one more question come in, but I want to make sure we have time for Karen's presentation. So if you don't mind, we're going to launch uh, the poll right now. Yep. And this is just a true or false question. Uh, true or false? You need a mouse to use the PDF unembed font tool. True or false? You need a mouse to use the PDF unembed font tool. All right, and those responses are coming in really quickly. And the question that we skipped over was: Does this prop embosser the pics faster? Can you print Braille and large print labels? It would be cool if there were the ability to do both. If not. Work embosser in Braille translator program does this. Also, do you need to use your swell paper? Can you use regular Braille embossing paper for this embossing, such as graphics? So it doesn't print, it only prints, it only embosses Braille and tactile graphics. So it doesn't do large print labels. Uh, that would be cool. Um, and if you want to do stuff like that, you're going to want a very special kind of embosser, like an interlined embosser. If you want them separately, I would maybe recommend you get an embosser and a printer uh, because, you know, a printer to do large print and then the embosser for the, for the Braille. Uh, and then Karen can probably address the questions about swell paper. I, I hope, I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot. Hey, no <laughs> worries. <laughs> All right. Well, 
This is a good as transition as any. So true or false, you must use a mouse to use PDF unembed font tool. 100% said false, and that is correct. So thank you guys for participating in that check-in poll. And without further ado, Karen, we're gonna hand it over to you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And we're gonna go a little bit low tech and build your confidence. So um, what I'm going to do is just give you some really quick um, ideas for embellishing uh, TMAP graphics to make it perhaps maybe a little bit more meaningful to the student. So in this particular instance, uh, Greg generated and embossed this print tactile map and it shows one Telegraph Hill Boulevard, San Francisco. And although it's probably perfectly readable as a map, some students might benefit from additional tactile embellishments or enhancements. So I didn't really go too off the charts in terms of adding more things to it because then you deal with clutter. But some of the embellishments I did, um, I took graphic art tape, which is a crepe texture, and it, I used it to represent the main streets and the road into the park. I also used a velour, sort of a green soft texture to represent Pioneer Park. And then also for the tower, for Coit Tower, I took and just made two um, identical red two millimeter thick foam circles and layered those to build up the point symbol to be more recognizable within that park area so the finger could quickly pick up where it is located. And I also used white stiff felt strips to represent the walking paths within the park. So one thing I wanted before we go to the next slide, be sure that if you do any embellishments or you make any adjustments within the tactile display, be sure you uh, carry that over into the key or legend to make sure everything is consistent for the tactile reader. And then we can go to the next slide. So here's a second map of the famous Lombard Street that we've been talking about in San Francisco that was generated with T-maps and output on an embosser like Pixblaster. Again, it's obviously perfectly readable, but I wanted to do a few tweaks just to make it more of a hybrid version. So what I did here was I took the same green velour soft texture to carry that consistency if you're working in combination with between the two maps with the student to represent the park or grassy areas. The smooth yellow craft foam I thought would be really good to kind of pull attention to Lombard Street. I cut it to about an eighth of an inch wide and it was that becomes very flexible. It's already adhesive backed it becomes very flexible and I could get those hairpin turns that are so indicative of Lombard Street. The white stiff belt, again, a carryover from the previous um, map to, to maintain consistency, represents walking paths within the park and along both sides of Lombard Street. And though you probably can't tell uh, or see it, I applied a clear tactile arrow sticker um, directly on top of the north indicator arrow just to make it more prominent within the map. So keep in mind, also I wanna backtrack just for a minute. So that circle that's in the print map, that was the search address. And I thought it just to simplify it, I went ahead and took the liberty to take that yellow foam, craft foam strip, just to show the continuity of the Lombard Street. Um, also keep in mind that you can add other points of interest to this existing map. For example, if you're like me, I would wanna highlight and point out where the location of your favorite chocolate shop is on one of the nearby corners. So you can embellish it with additional buildings. Keep in mind too, on the crepe textured tape, um, I was thinking when the question came up about sidewalks, there's different widths of that um, that you can use to uh, represent those as well. So let's move on to the next slide. And I'm just going to go through really quickly sort of APH's toolbox of uh, available materials that you can use to embellish these maps. I've alluded to the graphic art tape that's available in three different widths, a 16th inch, 1 8th, and 1 4th. And the tape is, a, like I said, a crepe texture, very recognizable against a smooth texture like your braille paper. And then the thinner widths can follow curved lines if you're, it just takes a little finesse and practice to get it to actually meander along the paths, paths that you want. Um, consider even applying double layers of that tape to get a higher elevation or profile to that line. Next slide, please. And APH offers two kits of carousel of textures with a variety of textured sheets that can be embellished or used as embellishments to existing maps and graphics. So textures range from bumpy, rough, grid-like, 
corrugated, stiff felt, and soft craft foam. And these textures are especially useful for representing aerial patterns or large regions of a map, such as water or as a park as we encountered earlier. Teachers also use uh, these materials for a plethora of uses from creating bar graphs, adapting storybooks, and creating tactile worksheets. Next slide, please. APH offers a variety of embossed fill and pillow tactile stickers. So you can use a variety of number and alphabet stickers to apply to the pre-embossed maps. Uh, the tactile point symbol stickers are especially ideal for the situation to indicate landmark indicators within the map. Remember point symbol, uh, Point symbols are those elements or tactile elements that fit very comfortably under the fingertip, can be recognized in, in a very quick instant among the rest of the elements within the map. So some of the shapes that you would um, be afforded by those stickers are an X or a raised bump or a circle raised outline or an arrow shape. And next slide, please. APH offers also offers a tactile graphic line slate that is used just like a conventional braille slate where you sandwich the paper between the two leaves or the uh, hinged leaves of the uh, slate. So with the two-ended stylus, you can emboss a variety of lines such as dash line, a wide or narrow line, a railroad line, a very bold bumpy line. And there's even a line type that affords um, your lead line, which is an insignificant line within a map that leads from a label to an, an identifying point within the map. So that, that's a tool that works with a, an abundance of substrates, whether it's your braille paper, tactile drawing film, or even a heavy gauge aluminum diagramming foil. And then the last slide I have here, next slide, is your APH, APH's line drawing toolkit. So that, that kit affords um, discernible lines with an embossed page. So you'll get a double dotted line, a directional line that if you feel the finger will detect whether you're moving left or right in one direction or the other, a low lead line. Now you'll have to tool those lines from the reverse side of the page so that they come up on the positive side on the reverse side of your map. But you'll have those lines in the existing map to trace and follow when you're tooling. So that, that set of tools is also available in our APHS Tactile Graphic Kit. So that pretty much rounds out um, our Tactile Toolkit. And um, if you have any questions at this point, I can fill those quickly. One question came in, uh, more of a statement. It can help to trim the sticker border away or round corners. I'm assuming that's of the feel and peel line. That's and that's an excellent suggestion and you should do that. So what she's talking about is if you have a raised circle, outline circle on the sticker that is a square shape, just go ahead and trim that, the, what I call the pie crust, away from that raised circle so that, that, so that the square doesn't become part of your tactile map. It's just the point symbol itself. So excellent point. All right. Also, uh, this, this participant shared you can put added lines on the underside of a map to limit clutter. Awesome. That's a good idea too. Thanks Great. for sharing it, that. Yeah, any other questions for Karen about some of the products she's talked about today? Well, let's go ahead and launch the poll. This is our final one today. Yes. We have two questions. And we want to know what tactile graphic method do your students encounter the most? There are several choices here. Pick the one that is that they encounter the most. And your choices are collage, microcapsule, thermoform slash vacuum formed, embossed paper graphics, hybrid, which is a combination of, of different methods, drawing film, like uh, you would get on the draftsman or the tactile doodle other or none. And then the second question, do your students participate in creating their own tactile graphics or maps? Yes, no, or depends on the situation or student. Great, and while people are filling out the poll, we had another response come in, Karen, in the chat. Hello, thank you for this webinar and so much good information and great to hear these resources about tactile enhancement of graphics. We are so fortunate to have this organization.
question. What colors does graphic art tape come in? In my experience, I volunteer with other visually impaired and blind people to tutor them and teach them. I've only found graphic art tape in a few colors though. I wonder if there's more variety I don't know about. So what colors and also are there more than two sizes of graphic art tape? Oh, Karen, you're on mute still. <laughs> no worries, happened to me. <laughs> Oops, I was trying not to interrupt anybody. Um, it, there's actually three widths. There's a sixteenth, a fourth, and an eighth in terms of the graphic art tape. There's only black available. However, commercially out there in the market, you might look at craft, craft supplies. There are some um, different colors available in the same width. Um, so if you search around out there, it's the graphic art tape we provide on quota is Taylor kind of custom packaged with our suggestions, but they it is a commercially available type of product. I am currently working on another product soon to come probably next year that will offer a, a more robust uh, assortment of tactile lines. Great, sounds like there's a lot of excitement in the market for more, more sizes and colors. All right, well, let, we'll check in with our Ooh, we had another question come in. I or response. I have purchased nail art tape on Amazon that comes in different colors. It has been used on projects by students and me. Also colored electrical tape on Amazon. Yeah, that the nail tape that you can use either for an embellishment on your nail or to segment a nail before you paint it. Excellent. And uh, and colored electrical tape. Um, another question came in. What is the best tactile marker or crayon if you have an opinion, Karen? Hmm. I don't have a direct opinion on that other than I just want to mention that APH does offer some rubbing plates so that use can be used in combination with off the shelf crayons. So they're in a, a kit called color by texture. And so you would put these heavy gauge, um, they're, they're actually like a really thick thermoformed plastic into a tray, put your coloring page or other tactile map for that matter, take your crayon and you can transfer that texture, whether it's bumpy or diagonal stripe. Um, and there's, I think there's six different textures available and then transfer those textures um, to the upper surface, whether it's a coloring page or the tactile map, that makes sense real quickly. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and close down the poll and share the results. What tactile graphic met method do your students encounter the most? The majority at 44% said embossed paper graphics. The next largest category said hybrid graphics or a combination of methods. Uh, the next largest categories look to be thermoform or vacuum formed collage and none at all. And do your students participate in the creation of their own tactile graphics or maps? 19% said yes, 28% no, and 53% said it depends on the situation or student. So thank you guys so much for completing that poll. I'm gonna hand it over to Paul for our closing notes. Well, let's talk about what we have discovered today. So you can create or request a free team map account so that you can create your own tactile maps once you get it. TMAP is able to create street, map, street maps based on an address. And of course, there are resources available to embellish a map. And real quickly, let's just talk real briefly about the Pigs Blaster. You've heard about it today. It is one of our two APH embossers available on quota for $3,995. Uh, APH.org slash Pigs Blaster will get you there. We should have a link for that. Uh, if not, that will we'll get you there. And you can get more information, check out the videos and find out more about what it can do. So we appreciate you coming in and checking out this webinar today. I hope it was informative and that you'll explore TMAPs and see how well they work for you.